the newspaper this morning, I read about this five-year-old boy called Omar, in, and his house got bombed in Syria. And his father said that it left him injured in his hip and his leg. But by now, when the article was written, his physical wounds were healed. But the father said that he still had like psychological wounds. He didn't dare to be alone, and he was crying a lot, and the parents didn't know how to, to soothe him. Um, and it's estimated that towards the end of this year, there will be about 700,000 people fleeing Syria to neighboring countries and other countries, and to here as well. Um, and in one month, I will take three clowns to perform in some of the Syrian refugee camps in Jordan. And the idea to do that is what this talk is all about. I will share with you some stories uh, and some pictures from clown expeditions to some of the more difficult places around the world. And I've been very fortunate to be able to bring a lot of really funny people to a lot of really shitty places. And this has led me to um, believe in the power of laughter. Laughter's power to spread joy, obviously, but also dreams and hope to inspire people in crisis to be creative. And those experiences have also motivated me you know, to share these people's stories and to somehow inspire other people to action. In this first place I'd like to take you to, it could be you know, pretty much anywhere. The children are seated on the ground under a scorching sun. They are dressed in either you know, donated smelly clothes or school uniforms or prison fatigues. And they don't really know what's about to happen, but they know something's going on. And these children, most of them probably grew up here in this camp, in this orphanage, in this institution for disabled. And chances are that some of them will die here. And suddenly there is a movement in the red curtain placed in front of the children seated on the ground, and the face of a clown peeks out. And the clown looks curiously and cautiously at the children, and she says, uh, Hello! <laughs> and a hundred voices reply, Hello! So she's encouraged, and she steps out from the curtain, and she waves and says, Hello! And a thousand voices reply, Hello! See, these refugees, these orphans, these child laborers, they say, I'm here, look over here, see me, I exist. Clown, she seems utterly unprepared for this situation, so she wonders what to do. And uh, oh, she finds ah, looks like a paper bag. It could be like one of those air sickness bags that she picked up on the way there. And it's okay. Oh. And she finds uh, yeah, it's a ball. Okay, she tries a trick. It's a daring move, we'll see if it works. Maybe she'll get an applause. <laughs> and then she offers uh, a volunteer from the audience to throw the ball into the bag, and unlike here, like all the kids want to help. I can do it, I can do it, let me try, let me try. And so she carefully picks a snotty little girl on the first row to catch the ball. And to wait, wait, I have to uh, find the right place to be here and here. Okay, and on the count of three, with the help of everyone assembled, this not little girl will throw the ball into this magical bag. Are you ready? One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> and she gets a clown nose. Thank you. Very good. Laughter makes you feel alive when death is all around. This first picture I showed you uh, is from Haiti, and so is this one from 2010, only weeks after the big devastating earthquake, the earthquake they've left you know, hundreds of thousands of people homeless. So clowns from several countries went there to perform in camps for children who lost their parents, to perform in temporary hospital wards in dirty tents, and uh, 
basically we set out to make people laugh. And this can sometimes be a, a challenging idea. You know, sending clowns, why don't you send food and blankets and medication? We have learned that the international community have become quite skilled in providing food and shelter for, for victims of war and victims of natural disasters. But, you know, when there is some food, and there is some shelter, and there doesn't seem to be any immediate danger, then what? You know, the weeks drag on, or the months drag on, or as the case is in many refugee camps, the years or decades drag on, and you're supposed to heal, and you're supposed to remember who you were before this awful thing happened, then what? Well, I will quote a diary from the clown you see on this picture, David Lichtenstein, from when he was clowning in Haiti in 2012. Tiny girl missing an arm, her huge head bandaged, hugging me over and over. Another girl missing only a toe, but who had been stuffed next to a dead mother for three days still in shock, smiling for the first time in weeks. The singer's song skit, it causes uproarious laughter, and uh, there is a birthday boy. He's bandaged uh, in bed, immobile, but we involve him a lot in the show. We find a handkerchief in his shirt, etc. And an old lady, she has to hold on to people around her not to fall out of a wheelchair because she's laughing so hard. And another woman tells us that this was the first time she had seen people laugh since the earthquake. The professional artists who volunteer on these clown expeditions, they have to be able to perform you know, within 15 minutes, without a stage, without electricity, uh, for between five to 5,000 people. Uh, and you know, they don't share any common spoken language with, with them, and they have to make them laugh. It's as simple as that. But luckily, the clown is an expert in establishing interhuman connection. The clown exists only in the here and now, doesn't have a past, doesn't have a future, but only exists in connection, creating play with an audience, big or small, hopefully resulting in laughter, and sometime in excitement. Like this little boy who sees uh, Daniel the acrobat who just snatched the bag of goodies from his master's hands and he's running for it. And this is one of the first Swedish clown expeditions to refugee camps in Macedonia in the 90s. Laughter makes you connect when connection is broken. Moldova is one of the poorest countries in Europe. And um, this picture is from uh, an institution for underprivileged children or children with special needs in rural Moldova. It's run by a former police officer who happens to be a raving alcoholic. And in this school, um, children with learning disabilities or you know, difficulties to concentrate are mixed with children with intellectual dis uh, disabilities and sent off to this desolate village where there's nothing. Uh, and in front of a window in the hallway of this institution, I see the silhouette of a skinny 10-year-old boy, and he does this. For hours, that's what he does, until someone grabs him by the arm and leads him to the canteen or to the dormitory. And when spoken to, he doesn't respond, and the others tell me that his name is Igor. And we stay at this institution for three days, and uh, we leave in the mornings to perform at other institutions in the region, and in the afternoons we come back and we play with these children, we teach them how to juggle, and we throw a disco. And uh, on the third afternoon, as we return, uh, the first child to run out from the house to greet us is Igor. And I'm amazed because he is running, he is waving, he's jumping, he is smiling. These children, they know how to hug, and they hug hard, and they won't let go. Laughter unifies beyond political divisions. So next up is Burma, just a couple of years ago. Burmese secret police are watching our show at a handicap center run by monks. Well, secret police, everybody knows they're police, but anyway, they're the secret police. Uh, and as the show progresses, 
the agents, they move closer and closer to the stage in order to see the show better. Um, and, you know, one clown has a ball and eats it. <coughs> and the other clown <laughs> takes it out of his ass and smells it and eats it. <laughs> and the first clown <laughs> takes it out of his ass and <laughs> <laughs> and by this time, the secret police, police agents have moved so close to the stage, actually blocking the, the side for some of the kids, and the clown just offers the ball to the police. <laughs> and they laugh, and the monks see them laugh, and the head monk falls over from laughing. <laughs> Laughter signals possibility when there is no hope to speak of. The UNHCR Camp Kisiba for Congolese refugees in Rwanda. Now, this is one of the, well, the most beautifully situated refugee camp I've ever seen. On a clear day, you can see down uh, to the silvery surface of Lake Kivu, and on the other side of the lake, you have the Democratic Republic of Congo. And in, you know, like in any camp, it's cram-packed with children, and most of them are born here. And before I show, I come to talk to a couple of teenage boys. They are calm and skinny, but kind of a bit too cool to see the clown show for the younger kids. But they're very nice. And I notice that their English is unusually good, and they even speak French. So they seem, you know, quite well-educated, aware about the world. But at 15, they've hit the ceiling of the camp's educational system. And, uh, you know, they're not welcomed in the surrounding country Rwanda, so they can't work and they can't go to college. And if they were ever to you know, return to Congo, where they've never been, they most likely have to you know, be able to grow their own food. That's the skill they need. So I, I think, well, what about computers and the internet? And they tell me that the nearest internet connection is, is in the village, you know, down the mountain, and they can't afford the trip. So they're completely isolated on this hilltop. And they look so tired, these children almost resigned, but they still want to tell me their story, and you know, I have nothing to offer to these children other than my presence, which is a very you know, small reminder that they're not completely alone. So on this you know, hilltop, with this astonishing view, I'm overwhelmed by the enormity of the situation, the enormity of the suffering and the hopelessness. And then in the corner of my eye, I see the giant blue snake of children in blue school uniforms meandering down the hillside towards our playground. And they're marching in lines with the swinging arms like this, like they've been taught. But as they come closer to our playground and start seeing the clowns and the acrobats, they can't control themselves. They start running. It's, they shout, it's circus, circus! Because these camps, they don't get many visitors. I mean, the staff come and go, and then the odd group of clowns, and they remember us. In crisis, not least children, of course, need help to get out of there. And then they need help to realize that they are something else than a refugee, an orphan, an earthquake victim, a disability, a victim of abuse. And they need to be reminded that they also exist somewhere beyond their confinement, you know, beyond their apparent borders. The clown watches the world with naive, curious eyes, and she says, wow! And she looks at the children and the surroundings, and she's searching for a common language, a game. And the children and the clown together, they discover this new amazing place that no one expected to find right here. And you see this as the children start to smile and laugh and run and jump and dance and hug and hug some more. And if you happen to be the one they're hugging, then you know you found this amazing place as well. And then you know that for at least for this moment, you are all right. And that knowledge will take you by the hand. I'd like you to leave here today with the memory of the clown's motto. 
Comfort the disturbed, disturb the comfortable. Thank you.